Hello everyone, it's Luke Kennedy and here's what I have for you today. We'll learn about planning a presentation and using speaking skills, share things equally in maths using fractions, and explore the different types of interactions between plants and animals in the environment. Do you like giving presentations? Today in English, let's investigate different presentation skills that we can use to help us deliver an engaging and exciting performance. Hello. Presenting to our class or in front of a group of people can be a little challenging for some, but never fear. Today I'm going to give you some tips to help you with your presentation, to make you feel more confident and to keep your audience entertained. We'll start with speaking skills. Have you heard of volume, pitch, pace, tone and pausing? Let's start with volume. This one is easy because it simply means how loudly or quietly you speak. Try saying this sentence loudly. I am feeling excited about giving a presentation. Now, try saying it quietly. I am feeling excited about giving a presentation. What did you notice when you changed the volume of your voice? You probably noticed how the volume you used had an effect on the way it sounded and it suggested different emotions. No matter what volume you use, you need to make sure your voice is clear and audible, which means that people can hear what you are saying at all times. Watch out for speaking too softly or too loudly or mumbling or using the same volume throughout your presentation. You can vary your voice to keep the audience interested. What about pitch? Pitch is the range of your voice from high to low. This does not mean how loudly or quietly you speak. Instead, pitch can be used to add emphasis to a point by changing how deep or high your voice sounds. A lower pitch is generally more pleasing to the audience though. Let's try. Raise your voice at the end of this sentence by making it go high. Thank you for listening to my presentation. And now, end on a lower pitch by making it sound deep. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Did you notice a difference in the way you sounded when you changed pitch? Maybe you felt that the lower pitch made you sound like you had authority and that you were sure of what you were saying and that you were very serious. While a higher pitch might have made you sound uncertain or like you were asking a question or making a joke. Pitch is a powerful tool that we can use when we are speaking. When we talk about the speed of our speech, we are talking about pace. Think about pace when you present. It's important to make sure that you don't talk too quickly, otherwise nobody will understand what you are saying. However, you also don't want to talk too slowly, as this can make it hard to follow what's being said. Try speeding up and slowing down for effect. For example, you can slow your speaking down to build suspense. I can't believe what happened next. Or speed it up to make it sound urgent. I can't believe what happened next. Tone refers to how we express an attitude. When we are speaking, this is shown in how we say the words. Tone injects some animation into what you're saying. So think about the tone that will suit your presentation. If you were giving a very serious presentation, would it make sense to sound like everything was a joke? No. If our tone of voice did not match what we were saying, people might become confused. It's important that our tone complements or supports what we are saying. And finally, pausing. Pausing allows time for the audience to think about what you've just said or to pay close attention to what is coming after the pause. Typically, we pause for punctuation at the end of a sentence or at the end of one idea and before we begin the next idea. You can use pause effectively to create interest and tension 
and to give time for the audience to think about what you have said. When standing up in front of an audience, no matter how many people there are, you need to consider your presentation skills. Effective presentation skills will increase your confidence when speaking to an audience. Developing good presentation skills can take some practice, but the practice is definitely worth it. As we mentioned before, it's really important to match what you are saying with how you are saying it. You can make your presentation even better by thinking about the way you use your face and body to match what you are saying. Facial expressions, body language, eye contact and gestures are important and can enhance the meaning of what you are saying. If you say something sad, but your facial expressions, your gestures and body language look really happy, you won't send a clear message to your audience. And this might mean that they become confused. As a presenter, you want to make a connection with your audience and show them that you know what you're talking about. One way that you can do this is by making eye contact to help you make eye contact, try and learn a bit about what you're going to say by practicing. It is useful to practice your presentation to help make you feel more comfortable presenting and to ensure you know what you're trying to say. Sometimes in school, you will be asked to present to your class and you may be asked to present in different ways and for different purposes. Sometimes you will be asked to present to share information. Other times you will be asked to present to persuade your audience. Other times you will be asked to present in role as a character from a book or film or another kind of text. Let's pretend that I have to deliver a presentation in character to share information on my favourite book. To act in character, I need to think not only about how the character acts, but also about how they think and feel. Once I choose which character to play, I will also decide on the events in the story that I might discuss. And I particularly need to think how my character feels about those events. I will have to think about the words they would use to show their thoughts and feelings clearly to the audience. And of course, in planning my presentation, I would need to think about volume, pitch, pace, tone and pausing. And I would also plan to use my presentation skills to engage and persuade my audience. Presentations can be a little scary, but planning, practicing and thinking about presentation skills can help you feel more confident. And remember, practice makes perfect. Today, why don't you experiment with volume, pitch, pace, tone and pausing when you are talking to your family and friends? Do they react differently when you speak in different ways? Well, that's all for today. See you next time. It's a very useful mathematical skill to be able to understand fractions because they're used all the time in everyday life. We share all sorts of things with our friends and family and we should always try to be fair and share things equally. Hi there. Are you ready for a quick warm up? I'm going to show you some pictures and you need to identify whether the picture represents halves, quarters or eighths. I'll count from five before I reveal the answer. Ready? Which fraction is represented? Five, 
four, three, two, one. This fraction is one half. Let's try another. Which fraction is represented? Five, four, three, two, one. The apple is cut into four equal parts, so each piece of the apple represents one quarter. Are you ready for one more? Which fraction is represented? Five, four, three, two, one. There are eight equal slices of birthday cake, so each slice represents one eighth. By using the same thinking, we can share collections of objects into halves, quarters and eighths. We just have to make sure the parts are all the same size. Here is a collection of counters. There are 24 of them. Let's share the whole collection into two equal parts. In other words, let's split it into halves. Let's check to make sure we've got halves. I'm going to count to make sure the piles are the same. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This pile has 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. This pile has 13. They're not the same, so it's not half. If I take one from this pile and add it to the other pile, I'll have 12 in each pile. Now I've split the whole collection in half. Now let's split the whole collection into quarters. I need to make four equal piles. So if I split each half into two, I should get four equal piles. I'm going to count to make sure the piles are the same. One, two, three, four, five, six. This pile has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. This pile has six. One, two, three, four, five. This pile has five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This pile has seven. They're not the same, so it's not split into quarters. But if I take one from the seven pile and add it to the five pile, there'll be six in each pile. Now I've split the whole collection into quarters. It's time to split the whole collection into eighths. So if I split each quarter into two, I should get eight equal piles. I'm going to count to make sure the piles are the same. This pile has three. This pile has three. I can see that all the piles are three. I've split the whole collection into eights. If each of these counters was a sweet, juicy strawberry, would you rather have a half, a quarter, or an eighth of the entire collection? I love strawberries, so I'd choose the half share because it's the biggest. By using the same thinking again, we can split any length into halves, quarters and eighths. We just have to make sure the final parts are, again, all the same size. Here is a length of licorice. I'm going to cut it in half. With this next length of licorice, I'm going to share it among four people. So I will split the length in half and then each piece in half again to get four equal pieces. With my last length of licorice, I'm going to share it among eight people. So I will split the length in half. 
and now each piece in half again. Then in half again to get eight equal pieces. Which fraction of licorice would you choose? A half, a quarter, or an eighth? I would choose one eighth because I don't like licorice very much and I only want the smallest piece. Okay, let's go over what we've learned today. We now know that we can describe fractions as equal sized parts of a whole. We can represent fractions of a whole, a collection and a length. That's all from me today. Thanks for joining me to explore fractions a little further. The cutting of a piece of licorice was a fun way to understand fractions, wasn't it? It's time now for some tips to staying healthy. Here's Isaac. Hey guys, and welcome to Health Chat with Isaac. I'm Isaac, and today I'm going to be giving you guys some helpful tips on how to remain happy and healthy while staying at home. Firstly, we're supposed to be social distancing ourselves from our family and loved ones. But that doesn't mean we still can't use technology to check in on them. You can use FaceTime or Skype to help check in on your friends, classmates or loved ones. Maybe even play a game of I Spy. Hi Grandma! Secondly, it's still really important that you're going out and getting fresh air when you need it. Move your body by going for walks around the neighbourhood or dancing in the backyard to your favourite song. Thirdly, if the news is making you anxious, turn it off and walk away. It's important that we all stay positive. Lastly, you could maybe even try to look up some online yoga or meditation classes. Put on some relaxing music and give your mind a break. Hum. I hope that these tips can help you with your well-being and mind whilst you're staying at home. See you guys next time on Health Chat with Isaac. There's so much about the world of science that I find super engaging. For me, one of the most exciting dynamics is the type of interactions between plants and animals. Today, Jen is going to talk to us all about predators and their prey. Have you ever seen a hawk swoop down out of the sky and capture a small animal like a mouse? Or perhaps you've seen a spider trap a fly in its web. These are examples of predator-prey relationships. The hawk and spider are predators, and the mouse and fly are their prey. You may have heard the term balance of nature. Predators help to keep the number of prey, their population, from getting too big. If the number of one type of animal in an environment gets too large, this will affect the delicate balance of other interactions. Did you know that the Venus flytrap is also a predator? It is a carnivorous plant, which means that it obtains its food by eating other animals. When an insect brushes against the tiny hairs on the plant, it triggers the trap to close with the insect inside. The insect is then dissolved by digestive juices, reducing it to fertilizer, which is how the plant obtains its nutrients to grow. Now let's explore two other types of relationships between organisms, competition and mutual benefit. When we compete in swimming, spelling or cooking contests, each team is aiming to get the same prize. Competition in nature is the same. It is an interaction between animals who are both trying to get the same resources in their habitat. Food, water, shelter or a mate. Let's explore this relationship in Africa. 
The Serengeti National Park is famous for its large predators like lions, cheetahs, hyenas, wild dogs and crocodiles. But it is also home to a diverse range of herbivores or plant-eating animals like elephants, giraffes, zebras, buffalo and antelopes. Now lions and cheetahs are both different types of big cats, but they both feed on the same type of prey, like antelope. Because they both eat antelope, we call lions and cheetahs competitors. The individuals that are faster runners, have better eyesight and better stalking abilities are better at capturing their prey and will have food for their families, while the others will go hungry. This can then impact the survival of the population. If they don't receive enough food, they are less likely to survive. And in some cases, competition can lead to the elimination of a species. Antelopes also compete with each other for territory. Males lock horns and the antelope that is bigger or stronger or appears the most threatening with its horns is the winner and claims the territory. Now, let's look at one more example, elephants. Male elephants compete with each other in contests to find a mate. These contests involve the elephants signalling their strength using trunk movements, charging at each other and using their tusks as weapons. These contests are usually quite loud, with elephants roaring instead of trumpeting. The strongest elephant will win the contest and is able to find a mate. So we can see how competitive relationships are important for organisms to find food, territory and mates in the wild. But some plants and animals can both benefit from their interactions, and we call this a mutual benefit to both. This means that two different types of animals or plants are better off by interacting. For example, bees and plants have a mutually beneficial relationship as they feed on the nectar of flowers. In return, bees carry the pollen that sticks to their body during their visit to other plants. This helps pollination, an important part of the plant's life cycle. Clownfish and anemone also have a relationship where there is a mutual benefit. Anemone are predators of fish. They use their tentacles with stinging cells to capture fish as they swim by. But when clownfish make an anemone their home, they become immune to the stinging cells by producing a protective coating over their scales. In this relationship, the anemone benefits because the clownfish eat any dead tentacles, keeping the anemone and the area around it clean. And the clownfish also attracts fish for the anemone to eat. The clownfish benefits by having a shelter safe from predators like large fish, sharks and eels. They also get the leftovers from the anemone's meals. Let's look at an interaction between living things inside our bodies. While some bacteria can be harmful to our health, there are others that we rely on to be healthy. The human body, particularly the digestive tract, which includes our stomach and intestines, is actually home to over 500 different types of bacteria. These bacteria are microscopic organisms that help humans to break down food. This means that we are able to digest and absorb nutrients that we would not otherwise be able to do. In return, the human digestive tract provides a suitable home for the bacteria. So, mutually beneficial relationships allow both organisms in the relationship to thrive. Okay, let's recap what we've learnt today. We now know that there are different types of feeding relationships. Predator-prey relationships can help to control the size of populations. Competitive relationships occur when two organisms require the same resource to survive – food, water, mates and territories. And some relationships are helpful to both organisms. We say they have a mutual benefit. Now it's your turn. This afternoon you might like to observe the behaviour of plants and animals in your backyard. Record some notes on the types of interactions you see and identify what type of relationship it is. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Juice TV is a very special kids television program that is created at the Queensland Children's Hospital to help improve the hospital journey for patients and their families. They and their brothers and sisters have the chance to star in the TV show and host their own segments and we're excited to show you some of their work. So let's go on a wild adventure with Jack. Hi, I am Jack and I have an animal quiz for you and I bet you won't guess the answer. 
This animal digs bars one made a date. The mom gives birth to live young and looks after them underground. The mom goes out at night time to get leaves for her babies. Any guesses? It's a burrowing animal, a rabbit or wombat. Now nah, it's a giant burrowing cockroach. Wow. This is the biggest cockroach species in the whole world and it's been brought in by Lauren from Wildcore. Bear Lauren, these cockroaches are so big, where do they live? You're right, they are big. They're called giant Australian burrowing cockroaches and they like the tropical kind of parts of Australia where it's nice and warm, nice and rainforesty. So they kind of like a bit of a moist soil. Will I find these in one of my in my house? No. So these cockroaches are really different to the ones we might have at home. Those aren't native, those are an introduced species of cockroach. These are the native ones and they don't feed on food scraps. So they like to feed on what we've got down here, all the dead, dried up leaves that fall down onto the ground. So they eat those leaves up and then the bits that they poo out, that's what becomes our soil and, and the base of our habitat. So they're really important animals. Did you just bring the cockroaches or did you bring other animals? I have, I've brought some other special animals. Shall we go and meet them? Yeah. All right, Max here. He's called a squirrel glider. So he is a type of possum, you're right. It looks like a possum. He has worms. <laughs> he loves his worms. So he's a squirrel glider. So if you'll let me show you, Max has this stretchy bit it's of skin. It's eating worms, Daddy. <laughs> See that skin there on the side of his body? Yeah. And that's on both sides of his little body. So when Max is at the top of a tree and he wants to get over to another one, he'll jump stretch out his arms and legs to stretch out all that skin. Well done, and he glides. So that's where he gets the name Squirrel Glider. And the tail, this beautiful fluffy squirrel tail is his steering wheel. So you are definitely gonna have a little part of him. His little fluffy tail when he's gliding, he turns his tail like this. And that's how he guides his little body around. He is, he's the softest little thing in the world. Can it talk? Well, he's a very noisy eater. You can probably hear him chomping away on those worms. Yes, I can. So his big, round, googly eyes, they help him to see in the dark. Mm -hmm. So during the day, it's a little bit hard for Max to, to see what's going on. It's all a bit blurry, kind of like us trying to see in the dark, but at night time, he's got excellent vision. So that's when they like to come out and look for food, look for bugs and flowers and fill up. Mmm, beast there. Do you think you'd like to have a little cuddle of Max? If I get the worms out of the way? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, don't get your finger in the way. If he thinks that's a worm, he'll just grab onto you. There you go, you got him. Just give him, keep him nice and tight there. Good boy, that's perfect. Mm. Hey Max, do you have a favourite TV show? Juice TV, of course. Oh, and he's really fluffy. He is. Max has got beautiful fluffy fur. But our next little guy, maybe not quite so fluffy. <gasps> oh boy. Okay, Jack, this is Tinkerbell, and she is called a rough scaled python. So you'll feel when you touch her, she's got a really rough kind of a feel. <laughs> she's got a little ridge along each of her scales that gives her kind of like a sandpaper kind of a feel. Does, does she still have her veins? She's got teeth. So because she's a python, she doesn't have any venom. So she doesn't have fangs. She's definitely got some pretty big teeth there. But if she were to bite you, it'd be very painful. But she doesn't have venom, so you wouldn't get sick. Like me? She's my pet snake. Is so she trained? She does this a lot. So she's really used to being held and touched. She's not hungry. She's not scared. Do you think you'd like to hold her? Um, yeah. <laughs> I think you're brave enough. Okay. 
I'm going to keep her head over this way and I'm going to start with her tail in the middle of her body. What if she wraps around me? No, you're much stronger than Tinkerbell. So she only eats things like rats and mice and small birds. She definitely wouldn't eat something as big as a person. Now, have you got a free hand? If you can use that hand and put it just flat like this. Good job, that's perfect. See, it's not that bad, is it? No, it's not. Do you think she feels warm or cold? Cold. Yeah, so she's a reptile, so what black, makes... Black crocodile. Yeah, what makes them a bit different to oh, us? Does she have warm blood or cold? Cold. Yeah, so they we use... Have warm we have warm blood, so reptiles like snakes and lizards and crocodiles, they use the sun to warm their bodies. That's how they get more energy. It's time for us to slither away now. See ya. We've learned so much today, so give yourselves a pat on the back, and then maybe a pat on the other side, and maybe a pat on the top of your head as well. And keep that movement going, because it's time for a brain break with our special guest from the AFLW. Victoria is up next, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Hi, I'm Sam, and I play AFLW for the Gold Coast Suns. Just like you, I'm stuck at home. Let's get active now. The movements we're gonna do are based on the movements we do in Aussie rules. Make sure it's safe to do so, and you have enough room. Let's start by side squatting to this side. Come down, squat down and pretend you're marking a ball. Then explode up and come the other side. Let's see how fast you can explode out. The next move we're gonna do is come down into a plank. So your hands underneath your shoulders, feet out. We're gonna come into a bear crawl position like this. And just like I would in a game, crawl forward and stand up. And then let's come down again. Let's see how fast you can do it. Thanks for joining me. See you later.